Well, here at Summer North Place Church, you know a few weeks ago that Pastor Brian just kicked off this series really just on, on scriptures or passages of scripture that have been somewhat of life verses just that have impacted him deeply. And he said, you know, Scotty, while you're there, if you feel like as you pray, there would be certain scriptures that would just be uh, life shaping for you, something that has impacted you deeply. You know, feel free to jump into that series. And I'm so thankful that he did. My mind immediately went to a passage that I'm going to be looking at today in Matthew chapter 28. So we'll look at God's word here in just a moment. If you're taking notes, uh, you can just write down at the top of your paper there, you had one job. You had one. Anybody ever heard that phrase before? You had one job. Come on, wave at me if you ever heard. Uh, usually if somebody says it and they're saying that to you, <laughs> it, it's usually not a compliment, right? <laughs> if somebody looks at you and goes, you had one job. You know, they're usually not trying to make your day happier, you know, or better. They're letting you know, you missed the mark. You messed up. Uh, I, I remember when I was in junior high school, lived across the street from some friends of ours. They had kids the same age as, as myself and my brother. And, and so we, we were buddies and they were going to go on vacation and and they said, Scotty, would you come and, and watch our dog for us while we're away? I said, sure, glad to do it. They had this beautiful, beautiful collie. Anybody ever seen Lassie before? You know what I'm talking about when I say Lassie. This dog looked just like Lassie. Matter of fact, Lassie was not the dog's name, but I'm going to call it Lassie anyway. It looked just like Lassie. They said, can you watch the dog? I said, I can do that for you. And so they loved that dog like crazy. I mean, it, it was just, it was, they loved that dog. And so one day I was over there, and, and, and the, I, should, I should say, the dog, Lassie, had gotten out from the backyard. I was like, oh, dear Jesus. You know, I went over there, and I was trying to get the dog corralled and get back in, and it wasn't cooperating. It was showing me that Lassie was in complete control and that I had no authority. That's what that dog was and so I'm, I'm chasing come here come here no 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 don't run from me don't run from me. you ever been in a moment or situation where you're doing something and all of a sudden it kicks into slow motion because I was chasing Lassie and Lassie was running towards the street I saw Lassie I saw the street I saw a car coming I saw Lassie I saw the car I saw Lassie I saw the car no yes kind of a bummer way to start a sermon isn't it I mean it's just such a letdown let's just let's just end that part to say Lassie's in a better place now. Okay, let's just leave it at that. We're, not going, that's, that's, we're just going to move right along. I left, and I was like, oh, no. I just I can't believe it. Well, a few days later, the family got home, and I could hear them across the street calling for Lassie. I could hear them, hey, girl, where? I was like, oh, oh. You, you ever had a moment where you just wish the rapture would happen like right now? Like <laughs> right now. It's like, come on, G, blow that, blow that trumpet right now. I mean, I just, oh, man, I needed the rapture. But I, uh, I went ahead and I took the walk of shame, just walking across the street to them. The mom was there in the front yard and she came, hey, Scotty, hey. And you could hear the kids in the backyard calling for the dog. And the, the mom, she, she handed out a little gift, got me a little gift, you know, a little souvenir, a little thank you. It was a little, little keychain with my name on it. It was a little keychain. And, she handed it to me. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. Like, do you take it? Like, if you, if you failed, you know, if you failed your job, do you, do you no, no, I can't, you know, really. I, I didn't know, so I'm kind of like, what do I do? About that time, the kid ran around and said, hey, where, where, where's the dog? We're looking for one. We can't find I, I said, well, see, what had happened was <laughs> Lassie got out, and so I, I told them, but I'll never forget the look on their face. They shot me that look. Maybe you've been here with that look that just, it just sums up that phrase. They looked at me like, you had, come on, say it with me, one job. You ever been in a scenario like that before? You just failed miserably, you know, and it's just like you didn't, you didn't have a lot of things. You didn't have something. You didn't have many things. You just had one thing. And you didn't do that thing. That's a little bit about what we're going to talk about today in this message on the Great Commission because what has happened at this point in the story is that Jesus has come, and you know the story of the gospel, don't you? Come on, he came and he lived a perfect life. He died in your place and mine so that we could live in his place with with him he, he he was crucified as he was the payment for our sin on the cross he was buried in the tomb then he rose from how many of you are thankful that he rose from the grave come on he conquered death hell and the grave and before he ascended in heaven, he gets some of his followers just a group of them together he says now here's the deal i'm about to go and prepare a place for you but i'm gonna leave y'all here and i'm not leaving y'all with a lot of stuff to do 
Uh, you don't have to do a lot of things, but I'm going to tell you, here's just one thing. Just, it, it, you have one job, and he gives them what's called the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. If you're ready for this, say, I am. Come on, if you mean it, say, oh, yeah. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. Somebody say, all the nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands. Somebody say, all the commands. To obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He says, here's the dealio. I'm headed out. You have one job, one assignment, one responsibility. I want you to spend the rest of your days here on this earth telling as many people as you can, while you still can, about the hope that you have found in your relationship with me. Go and tell them the story of how I died in your place. Go and make disciples, followers of Jesus. Go and take what I've done in you and share that with the world around you. They had one job. Today, I want to encourage you that that same one job for them is still the same one job for you and for me. And if we're going to carry out the Great Commission, today I want to give you three things that I think will help you to do it and to carry out the one thing that he's left us here to do. Anybody excited about going to heaven? Come on, who's excited with me? You excited? Oh, I can't wait to go to heaven. I'm going. And you're welcome to come with me. I'm just excited. I'd love for all of y'all to show up. And on my way to heaven... Between here and there, I've got a job to do. And if we're going to do it effectively, three things. Number one, make it the priority. Notice I didn't say make it a priority. It's not one of my priorities, but I need to make it the priority. Priority. As a youth pastor, I was speaking at a youth camp. My family was there with me, and after the camp concluded, we were getting in the uh, family minivan, about to head up, move out. When you got as many kids as I do, you got to do the roll call, right? Because you can't leave, you can't leave a kid everywhere you go, right? And so we got to go through all the names. Candace here, Kelly Grace here, Bria, Bria. Bria was always missing. No matter when, Bria was never supposed to be. Always had to look around for Bria. And so in a situation like that, kids missing or something happens, my default, kind of my personality, my view on life is pretty chill. Like for the most part, I'm pretty chill. And so, you know, something like that happened, you know, something that happened, I'm like, hey, it's good, we're going to be fine. Hey, it's not a problem. My wife, my wife, my wife on the other hand, My wife doesn't react the same way I react. So she reacts a little bit differently when something like that happens. Now, in this case, she had a little more reason to react because at this retreat, at this campground where we were, they let us know that there had been a murder in the area and that the killer was on, a, on the loose. And they didn't know exactly where he was, but they had him identified as somewhere in the wooded area near our camp. And some of you are like, man, what in the world? How did it impact your camp? Powerful altars. I mean, powerful altars. Get easiest place to preach in the world. I'm like, kids, if he got you tonight, are you going to heaven? I mean, I just like, woo! We had some services, y'all. It was awesome. <laughs> so anyway, we can't find Bria. We're looking for Bria. Casey's like, oh my goodness, she's been kidnapped. Oh, she's probably being held captive. Terrorist something. Gee, this is terrible. This is something bad. And I was like, hey, here's the deal. We've got five other kids, right? <laughs> Let's go. Ah, I did not say that out loud. I promise I did not say that out loud. I did, and I started looking for her, right? So we're all looking for Bria. Hey, has anybody seen Bria? No, we haven't seen her. Ask leaders. You seen Bria? No, I can't find her. Ask security, hey, if you guys, we can't find Bria. Can, so now we have all of the camp looking for Bria. We check the chapel. She's not in the chapel. We check the cafeteria. Can't, she's not in the cafeteria. We check the swimming area. She's not in the swimming area. And at this point, like, even, you know, my heart is starting to be, I'm like, oh, my goodness, where is she and what is going on? So we're, we're looking everywhere. So now we're like, hey, we need to start checking the woods. And everybody's, like, spreading out and trying to find her. While we're doing that, can I just let you know that if you had come up to me in that moment and said, hey, 
What do you think about the Cowboys this year? How many know I don't give a rip about the Cowboys in that moment? I'm looking for my baby girl, right? If you had come up to me in that moment and if you had said, hey, what do you think about what's going on in D.C.? I'd be like, I don't give a rip what's happening right now in Washington. I'm trying to find my baby girl. If you had come up and said, hey, did you see the latest movie? I'd say, I don't give a rip about the latest movie. I'm trying to find my baby girl. If you had come up to me and you said, oh, we got some delicious food over here. You'd like to sit there. I don't give a rip about food right now. How many of you are tracking with me? I am looking for my baby girl. She's not something that I just happen to be thinking about. She is the thing that I'm looking. I'm like, I will not stop until I find my baby girl because she was my priority. Now, I've told that story before. One time my wife Casey was with me and she said, do you realize that you told that story and you never finished it? People don't even know if we ever found her or not. (laughs) So anyway, point number two. Let's just keep going here today and see what we can. All right, so we found her. And then the next question people ask is, so where did you find her? Well, uh, eventually she came out because she was hiding underneath a bed in the cabin. I said to her, I came in there and checked. Did you not hear me calling your name? She had a little lisp that she's outgrown, but I loved it. She said, yes, sir, I heard you. And I said, well, (laughs) I said, Then if you hurt me, why did you not answer? And she said, because we were playing hide and seek and I didn't want them to find me. I said, well, if you ever do that again, Jesus and I both are going to find you. And it is not going to be pretty. But in that moment, nothing else mattered. She was not a priority. She was the priority. And when it comes to the Great Commission, we have one job, and it's not just a part of, but it is the reason why you and I are still here. And if you've ever wondered why Jesus would leave heaven to come to this earth, he just clears that right up for us in his own words. He says in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, Jesus said, "This you're wondering why it came. Jesus said, I'll answer that for you. It's not confusing. You're not going to have to guess at this one. Luke 19, 10, Jesus said... Jesus said, here's why I've come. I have come to seek and save the lost. Why did Jesus come? To seek and to save the lost. The salvation of mankind is the reason, the sole purpose for Jesus coming to earth. You say, oh, wasn't that cool when he changed water to wine? It really was cool. That's just not why he came. Man, don't you love the story when he walked on water? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. But he didn't come to earth so he could walk on water. When he healed the blind men, when he healed the lepers, when he fed the 5,000, all of those are amazing stories. Just none of them are the reason for why he came. The purpose of why Jesus came to this earth was to seek and to save the lost. He only came to reach the lost. And the only reason you and I are still here is so that you and I can reach the lost. You ever thought just lately, maybe you've been processing or evaluating and maybe kind of looking within and asking the question of why your heart is still beating? Have you paused and just pondered a little bit lately and just you've wondered like why would I get out of bed again today? Most people, if you say, hey, why'd you get up today? Or tell me about your day and well, what are you going to do today? Most of us would answer things with answers like, because I'm going to work. I'm going to school. I'm getting up because I have to get some stuff done around the house. Uh, I have to mow the yard today, but can I just give you just this friendly reminder that if you are a follower of Jesus, there's so much more at stake in your day and why you still exist and why you're still here. And can I remind you that this is not just a priority, but why this needs to be the priority is because there's a real 
heaven to be enjoyed and a real hell to be avoided and time is short and eternity is long I'm on my way to heaven but the reason I'm still here is because he wants me to reach one more person while there is still time that's the only reason we are still here life is so short Eternity is so long. James says that life on this earth is like a vapor of smoke. It's here and then it's gone. Like life on this earth is just so short. Some of y'all are like, no, I'm exercising. Taking my essential oils. Eating my Wheaties. Flintstone vitamins. I'm going to give you a little longer. Okay, that one's for you right there. You're going to live a little bit longer. But it doesn't mean you live to be 90, 95, 100, 110. How many of you know at some point it's over? Life on this earth is short. Eternity is so long. Why don't we make the most of this knowing that we're living for there? Why can't? Why do we allow ourselves to get distracted with stuff? Change the water to wine. That was cool. Healing the blind man, important. I don't mean that other stuff that we're doing, it has no importance. I'm just saying it's not the purpose. Raise my kids. Have a healthy marriage. Earn a good living. Exercise. Whatever it would be. Good things. It's just not the reason why you're still here. We have, somebody say it with me, one job. We got to make it the priority. Let me give you the second thing. Not only make it the priority, but make it practical. Make it practical. Practical. When we talk about the, the, the job of carrying out the Great Commission, we can do, uh, tend to do a lot of talking about something that sounds very spiritual, very churchy, very religious, kind of some Christianese. And, and we say things like we got to spread the gospel. Uh, uh, we have to evangelize the unsaved. Uh, we have to change the world. We have to reach the lost. And, and we know what we mean in church circles by all of that. But at some point, it's got to move its way out of just the Christianese and put some street shoes on and get out and actually do something. So it's not just talking about the Great Commission, but about living it and carrying it out. How do we make it practical? I think one of the most powerful yet practical things that we can do if you want to see friends or family members come to know the Lord, the first thing is that you would pray for them. You say, well, Scotty, that sounds like such a Sunday school answer. That just sounds like such a, a church response. Well, I get it, but I'm just telling you, it's not our stopping point, but it must be our starting point. I love the way Ian Bounds writes about prayer, and he says this, to talk to man about God is a good thing, but to talk to God about man is greater still. See, in my desire, my effort to reach my family members or my friends who are away from Christ, it starts with me talking, not to them about God, but first me talking to God about them. Why? Because this is a very spiritual thing. You will never argue anybody into heaven. You, you'll never hear a story and testimony of somebody's life change. Hey, how did Jesus tell Well, we were fighting one day. I was fighting with somebody. They were a Christian and they outfought me. Like it, they just, man, they fought. We were mad. We were angry. We were hollering and cussing. But you know, at the end, I was like, well, you're right. I guess you're right. Uh, you'll never hear that. Why? Because this is not a head issue. It's a heart issue. It's a spiritual issue. And because it's a spiritual issue, the battle must be waged in the spirit realm. The battle is won in prayer. Not only should we pray, but here's a second practical piece. This one's going to blow you away. This one is profound. If you're taking notes, write this one down. If you want to reach people, if you want to carry out your one job, here's a very uh, practical thing you do. Ready? Number two. Here it is. Be nice. Just be nice. Anybody know any grumpy Christians? Don't point at them if they're in the room. But do you know anybody? They just seem like miserable. Just mad. Mad, mean, angry, grumpy, mad. Don't like this, don't like that, vocal about it. Opinionated, outspoken, opinionated, negative, mad. Oh, man, I don't like this, I don't like that. I don't like you, I don't like them, I don't like anybody. 
But you want to go to church with me like, man, I'm good. I'm really good. <laughs> whatever, you good whatever you got me, as fun as it looks, I think I'm good. Listen to what Scripture says in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 5. It says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Somebody say every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. It's saying just be smart. It's saying it's hard to fight somebody and reach them at the same time. If you're going to make the most of every opportunity, pay attention to your conversations. Let them be a, uh, a, 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 an attractive presentation of Jesus. Let them be appealing, seasoned with salt. Let it just be easy to swallow. Be about building bridges, not walls. Our goal is to win a soul, not win an argument. But sometimes that's hard for us to do because we work at places or, or we go to school places. And there are people who, who they aren't followers of Christ. And, and man, they just, just foul mouth. Like maybe at your work, just somebody with a foul mouth or just telling crude jokes, just inappropriate. And it just gets under your skin. It, it's frustrating to you, maybe even somewhere. And they're, they're taking the Lord's name in vain. And it's just, just oh, your blood pressure is just boiling. And it, I just want to give you a, a quick little insight right here. Here's this. Listen, listen. Lost people tend to act an awful lot like lost people. So next time, I'm all fired up and offended. Bothered. Mad. Oh, man. Did you hear that guy drives me? She's, she's a gossip. He's a liar. Like that guy, man, he's a manipulator. And yet you're all mad. Why are you mad? Because lost people act like lost people. Listen, that's not the problem. The problem is Christian people acting like lost people. The problem is those who say, I can't wait to go to heaven. And you ain't going. I mean, that's messed up. Like, that's what's wrong. Like, what instead of being offended and being mad and being angry, what instead if you say, you know what, I want to show the love of Jesus. I just want to be kind. I want to be encouraging. Like, I, it's their birthday. I'm going to be nice to them on their birthday. I'm going to highlight. I'm going to celebrate them. I'm going to, I'm going to say things that build them up. Question for you. What if all your friends and, knew, all your friends and family knew about Jesus was what they know? By looking at your life, what would, what would their picture of Jesus be? What would it look like? Just be nice. Be kind. Be happy. Act like you really believe what we claim about having Jesus Christ in our heart. And the hope that we have, the joy that we have, the peace that we have. And there's one more practical thing on how to make it practical. I want to give you this. It's not just that we would uh, be nice. It's not just that we would pray. But then this third thing is just that we would invest and invite. Invest and invite. Invest in that relationship. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 16 says, The gift makes way for the giver. Listen. The gift makes way for the giver, and you can invest and invite. And instead of being just grumpy and, and sour, said season with salt, not sour like a lemon. Don't go in and be negative. Don't, don't be critical. Don't be all outspoken and opinionated. Go in and build bridges, not building walls. And if you've got some people in the office that are difficult, listen, how many of you know if you show up at work tomorrow with some Krispy Kreme, it, it doesn't matter how much they don't like you. They like you now. How many know what I'm talking about? You go walking in with some coffee. You go and just start blessing people. Just start being kind. And, and some of you like Krispy Kreme, coffee. You know how much it costs these days? Like, listen, I do. I do. I get it. And that's a struggle for me. Uh, one of the things that we do as a family when we're staying in, in hotels is that we pray, God, use us. We're going to leave a tip 
before the housekeeper, and we're going to leave a, a spirit-led note. Lord, what do you want us to say? And we pray that God would give us specific things to share so that they will receive a gift. But through, through that gift, a specific word from the Lord. And so it's just a practice because a gift makes way for the giver. We think, man, that's an easy way to, to, to share the Lord. And listen, next time you're out somewhere, if you feel led to leave a note, but you're not leaving a tip, the devil is a liar. You better put some money down by that tip. Don't you be doing that. The gift makes way for the giver. You be kind. You be generous. So the other day, we're at a hotel, and, and I said to my wife, Casey, I said, hey, why don't you just pray and see what the Lord places on your heart and write it out here and got my wallet. I'm going to leave some cash. And, you know, I, I pulled out my wallet, and you, you know you've been here before, so don't, don't judge me and act all spiritual. All I had was a 20. <laughs> Man, it was a crisis of faith. <laughs> I was just like, oh, man. And, I wasn't, I wasn't planning on that, see? <laughs> and, and so she's like, okay, I got the note here. You got the money. I said, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run down the front desk here right quick. <laughs> so y'all judging me. I'm just being honest. I just, I wish I was more spiritual than that. But I went down there. I said, hey, I'm going to need some change. And, and, and the lady said, uh, I'm sorry. We don't have any change. I said, you don't have, you don't have any change? You don't have any? <laughs> I mean, I'll take 21s. I'll take... I'll take two tens. I'll go ahead and bump it up to a ten. If you got it, I'll take two tens. And she's like, I don't have any change. So, man, that whole walk from the front desk back up to the room. Mm. Lord, if it's your will. Lord, and so I got there, and I said, all I have is the 20, and I handed it to her. I said, hey, I think the housekeeper is right outside. Of, instead of the note, even if you want to talk to her, just here's the 20. And so, so she goes, and she blesses the housekeeper starts talking to her. about 10 minutes or so later she came back and she said that that was an incredible conversation you wouldn't believe it she said we were talking and, and I was talking about Jesus I laid out the whole gospel story we exchanged information it was powerful and in that moment I was so excited but so humble just embarrassed just ashamed I was literally wrestling with, man, that's, that's, that's my 20. I'm going to have to give that up. I wasn't planning on a 20. And it's as if Jesus, in his kindness and his compassion, whispered to me, I know. Cost me a little something to reach you. But I laid it all down on the cross so that you could experience me. Now all of a sudden I was looking at my 20 just feeling like, golly, what a spiritual loser. I just can't even. <laughs> and I'm just saying to my friends today, and I'm sharing that because I want you to know, hey, Don, I'm not trying to act like I'm Moses. But I have to put this into practice. Pray for divine appointments and then make the most of them when God opens the door. <laughs> When it looks like it's going to cost you more than an intended step into it. When a new neighbor moves into the neighborhood, be the first one there and show up. Hey, I'm Scotty. I got all the crazy kids over there. We just wanted to bring you this housewarming gift. The gift makes way for the giver. Whether it's at your school, in your neighborhood, at your work, it could be a simple invite into a relationship that you've cultivated to where then you just say, I go to this really cool place called North Place. I'm going back this Sunday. Since we've been going, it's just helped me. It's made a big difference in my life, in our marriage, or whatever your story is. But just invite them. Love to have you. You can sit with us. You know what? I challenge every single person, do that for this coming Sunday. Pray for a divine appointment. Invest. Be kind. And invite. Here's the last thing I'll share, and then we're going to close, and it's this. In carrying out your one job, make it personal. Make it personal. Everybody, every single person is a follower of Jesus. You have a story to be celebrated and communicated. Tell your story. I try to watch for opportunities when I'm out places, and, and uh, you know, for, for my wife, Casey, like, she's just a natural. So I'm just, I'm being real with you because I don't want anybody in here thinking, well, that's because you're a preacher. You know, that's why you do it, because you're a preacher. And so when you're at 
Bass Pro or you're at Lowe's, like you're just telling everybody about Jesus. Listen, my wife can, can go in at, for a loaf of bread. And she'll come out about an hour later going, oh, I, I led 15 people to the Lord. I'm like, of course you did. Of course you did. For me, whenever I go to do it, man, my heart starts racing. I'm more comfortable up here in front of thousands of people than I am on aisle number four, you know, l- looking at the milk or whatever and, and going, okay, Lord, him, okay, right now, okay, so you want me to do it? You want me to go first? Okay, Lord, is it right on three? Lord, okay, here we go. Like, I just get nervous. And so, you know, there's a guy there, and I'm like, hey, I know what I'm all about. I didn't come here for milk. Lord, you sent me here on a mission. He might need Jesus. So I just try to strike up a conversation, you know, and that's that, my wife. Easy for me. It's unnatural. So I'm like, you like milk too? I mean, whatever. I don't know. I'm just like, <laughs> crazy prices. Oh, they always go with the crazy prices. Everybody, amen you on that. You know, everybody's like. So we're talking for a second, and it's so like, oh, you're from the area. Oh, yeah, me too. Hey, do you have a church that you go to here in the area, somewhere that you go to church? And, and I could tell by his answer, he's like, uh, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I was, I, you ever been talking to somebody about Jesus, and you just knew they're lying? You know, you just do. Like, I'm like, man, you ain't got a church. I can tell you love a church. And so just uh, I was being a little bit honorary, and I didn't let him off the hook. So I said, oh, that's cool. Well, uh. What's your pastor's name? <laughs> it was a setup. I admit it. It was a setup. It was a setup. And uh, he looked at me. He's like, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. And so I was like, okay, well, he's, he's not wanting to talk, so I'm just going gonna, gonna to wrap it. I'm going to wrap it up here. But I just, so I'm just going to give it to him the best I can. Casey would have been great. This is just me. I'm just going to give it to him. And so I said, well, man, that's really cool that you have a church. And, and more than anything, I just think that's awesome that you know that there's a God who loves you. The God who cares about you and the fact that you're going to heaven forever. Isn't that pretty cool that that's your story? And he he looked at me and he's like, that's personal. That's my business. And turned his back. You know, turned his back and said, that's personal. And I thought, that is so weird. Not that this guy doesn't want to talk to me because at this point I figured it out. I get it. The weird part is just to use that line and the sad reality that a lot of Christians live their lives as if that is true. I have found peace. I have found hope. I have found joy. I have found eternal life. And I would tell you where you can find it, but it's personal. So good luck. I mean, that has got to be the dumbest thing that we could ever think or way we could ever live. I know that you're drowning in desperation. I know that you're broken and needing healing. I personally have found where to find the healing but because that's my personal business I don't talk about that and because I know you're going to be eternally separated from God forever bummer for you hope it works out this is personal well I would say yes it's personal but it was never meant to be private found people find people somebody who's been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ realizes the reason I'm still here is to tell somebody about his story and how it impacted me I give you this closing scripture Paul writes in Acts Acts chapter 20 verse 24 he says however I consider my life worth nothing to me my only aim is to finish the race And complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. That's it. One job. One responsibility. One thing that we're supposed to be doing. You're not a businessman who happens to be a Christian. 
You're a follower of God that he sent as a missionary to that corporate office. You're not a guy who sells insurance or a lady who's a school, te school teacher. You're not a football coach who happens to be a Christian. You are a follower of Jesus on your way to heaven. And the only reason you're still here is not to go work at the construction site, not just to earn a paycheck. The only reason you're still here is to tell people about Jesus. So, when was the last time you prayed earnestly for that friend, for that co-worker, for that family member who doesn't know Jesus? Are you praying, oh God, not just a little prayer, save them, Lord, bless the world, amen. No, oh God, they need you. Would you send the conviction of your Holy Spirit to work on their hearts so that they see and recognize how desperate they are for you? Lord, would you give me a divine appointment then and anoint me to step into it to know what to say? Lord, I'll mess this up unless you empower me. Lord, help me to be the kind of friend that they would trust and listen to. So as I invest, then I can invite. Lord, I'm praying for it. Making it practical. Just being kind. Make it personal. Going, I've got a story that is to be celebrated and communicated. Lord, this is the reason I'm still here. I consider my life worth nothing to me except for carrying out the Great Commission, sharing the news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To that end, let's commit ourselves. Let's not miss it. Let's be all about it. One day soon, we're going to be there, and you'll be glad you made the most of this because you did your one job.